Uh, thank you, Will. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I can't say how pleased I am to be here today for a number of reasons. And the first one is it's nice to be away from the spreadsheets um, that are going around Great Peter Street at the moment. Uh, as you know, we're in a, a very uh, tricky stage in our resource allocation process, um, if I can call it that. Um, but it's good to be out celebrating something really strong and positive, something that represents a real partnership, and as Nick said, a breakthrough. Um, I want to begin by, by expressing my gratitude to the BBC and the BBC Academy um, for making this partnership happen with, with our team at the Arts Council. Um, it's right that the two big public sponsors of the arts in this country should come together for something that's going to make a real difference uh, to how the arts uh, are made and experienced in this country uh, in the future. I hope. That's the aspiration anyway. Um, since we launched, since we, the Arts Council, launched our Digital Opportunities Programme in 2008, we've learned a huge amount about how the way you all currently use digital technology. We've learned a lot about your ambitions and the things that you've tried in terms of reaching wider audiences, um, taking advantage of the new of new ways to um, use, access, and distribute content, both perhaps expanding audiences or expanding access to things that are otherwise very um, hard to get into or to, to experience, but also deepening understanding and deepening those, the experience that we're offering um, audiences going forwards, and deepening our exploration of uh, the art forms we're involved in. Um, and I think this is all really, really important, and these are all kind of opportunities and possibilities that, that today is, is, is starting off. Um, I mean, Nick, you, you mentioned uh, a few examples on NT Live partnerships, which was a partnership between Nestor and the Nestor Arts Council and the National Theatre. And it was interesting seeing the debate in the, I think, in the Observer uh, the other week about whether it was the same thing, um, seeing something in a cinema rather than experiencing it um, um, live, as it were. And I think it's unashamedly a different thing. Um, seeing Verda, for example, um, in a cinema was was electrifying in a different way from, from seeing it in, in a, in a theatre. It was a different experience, it was, but it was a new way of encountering that particular piece of art. And as such, it was, it was um, a valid and valuable experience. And apart from anything else, you couldn't get in to see it physically. Um, and so, you know, the, the Danny Ball director of Frankenstein is going to be screened next week. And I think you get the chance to choose whether you see Johnny um, or Ben as the creature um, 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 and, and choose which one you like. So, you know, the fact that that is sold out till May and we can now sort of widen the experience around the country is, is tremendous. And then the Royal Opera House has been, been dabbling with Don Giovanni, 203 cinemas worldwide, Carmen in 3D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we've had our, the RSC's Hamlet, which by being broadcast had access to, to many more audience members and the wonderful Othello experience in Birmingham. So there's a huge public appetite for really high quality arts content and a hunger for it. And we know from our conversations with you uh, arts practitioners that you're itching to broaden your audience reach by taking the opportunities that digital technology offers. So how will this partnership uh, help that? Now, currently, we know that in many arts organizations, there's a gap between the desire to produce content and having the knowledge and skills and access to that, that knowledge and skills in-house to actually do it. So very early on, we realized that within the Arts Council, we had a role in helping somehow to provide the tools, the investment, and the expertise for you to share your extraordinary work with, with the wider world. And that might mean enhancing existing skills that exist in your organizations. It might also mean getting more ambitious forms of content out onto various platforms. It might mean understanding what the possibilities of those platforms are, and also understanding what the, 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 the nuts and bolts um, difficulties of, of, of doing that is. And then we found a partner. We, we, we um, found our marriage, um, hopefully made in heaven, um, um, and with the BBC Academy uh, being set up at about the time we were, we, were th we were thinking. The BBC Academy has the knowledge and skills that you and other organisations will need to achieve those ambitions. And, you know, as, as, as you said, there are things to learn from you as well. I mean, I think the coming together uh, between arts organisations and the Academy is going to produce something 
uh, really valuable that wouldn't otherwise happen. And it's, I, th I hope it's going to blow some, some a, a wind of something, creative, additional creativity um, into, into the BBC. So I think the series of workshops and seminars that are proposed will help organisations of all sizes, in all art forms, to gain the skills to produce and commission high quality arts content that really can be shared across current and, let's be clear, emerging uh, digital platforms. We did some research in 2008 and it showed that only 4% of the organisations we fund produce art in a, in a digital form. I mean, we really do want to increase that number. Um, and we really do want to help you as an organisation capture um, more of those excellent artistic performances that are happening every week across the country and reaching those broader audiences. So, I've already said, it's not about replacing uh, the thrill of a live performance. The thrill of a live performance will always be the thrill of a live performance. But it's, it's increasing um, the, the size of public engagement and also the nature of public engagement, deepening it and, and widening it in some ways and finding new ways of doing it that you haven't thought of yet. Um, you can, audience will be able to gain new insights into players and operas by watching them in different ways, but also by the, the editorialism that might go around the way in which they're presented. And, and currently, one of the other things that we're engaged with in the Arts Council at the moment is taking on responsibility for museums and libraries uh, by taking on responsibilities of the MLA. And we're, we're just at the beginning of the kind of technical exercise of physically doing that. But we're already seeing more and more possibilities of crossovers between the different sectors that we'll be uh, working with in the future. And only last week I was at Birmingham University sort of uh, literally experiencing 3, 3D encounters with, with historical objects, uh, which were very scary when it involved mummies. Um, but, but, but the person I was with was uh, from the ballet world and instantly saw choreographic uses of, of the technology that was being developed there. Um, and those crossovers, I think, increasingly, as we go on, will, will become very, very profound. So this partnership really does fit in with the Arts Council's 10-year ambitions for the arts, achieving great art for everyone, and especially our goal to get more people to experience and be inspired by the arts, but also the kind of wider goal about deepening that experience. You know, it, it, we start, our first goal is about excellent art, um, but we want people to, to really experience it in the best way possible and by a variety of means. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a huge possibility of, of choice here. I think also there's another of our goals around resilience of arts organisations and just our, our duty, if you like, to give arts organisations the means to improve, grow and develop and become more resilient um, as we go forwards. And I think having access to, to knowledge about the possibility of what um, the digital world can offer and being stimulated to try different things out and experiment in different ways. I think that's part of the resilience story going, going forwards. Um, so the partnership, I hope, is the first step towards enabling you and others to do that. We're also going to be um, enhancing the digital reach of the arts in the coming years through our Digital Innovation Lottery Fund, which we'll be talking about in coming months after the um, investment strategy announcements. And also partnerships that we're currently developing with Nesta, um, uh, again around innovation of various kinds. Um, and we also need to connect with the wider, wider creative industries and, and we see that as part of our, our mission going forwards. And I hope this partnership won't just be a benefit to the arts world, I hope it will benefit our, our, our partners. Um, because, and also that you, might, you will see the depth of expertise and talent and creativity and the breadth of work that's out there and see some of the possibilities going on as the, as the different ways in which we can, we can engage with you and partner with you uh, going forwards. Adding different kinds of content um, to platforms such as iPlayer and UV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because, as Nick said, in a time of reduced public support for the arts, it's more important than ever for us to get the best value out of what we're all putting in and to enter into these generous, mutually beneficial partnerships that really do draw best value for all the, the money, effort and creativity that we're all putting into to developing the arts in this country. So today is about getting your views as to how the Arts Council BBC partnership can help. We want your ideas, we want your creativity, we want connections to be made. Um, 
and we want we want to, you know, this to be the first step towards unleashing your skills to be able to commission digital content and do things in in different ways. Um, I think with your enthusiastic buying and your ideas, this this initiative has the potential to make all of our arts organisations um, not just national but truly international. We already know that the arts in this country are amongst the best in the world. By equipping you with the skills to create the best possible 20th century digital content uh, in its various um, emanations, we'll en enable you to connect with people across, across the country, across the nation, across the world, to inspire vast new audiences with the very best of the country's groundbreaking, innovative and inspirational art. So by being here today, you've made me very happy in a, uh, in a great number of ways. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, your comments um, and, well, and thank you to the BBC for working with us to make this possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alan. And now for the, the other side of the partnership, the, the male or the woman, I'm not sure which one, Alan. Um, Mark, you're going to play. Um, and now, I, I, I was involved with working with the BBC before I joined the BBC with Rowley and dealing with partnerships. And, and I worked with the BBC for about five years, sort of developing partnerships. For the first three years, it was impossible. Uh, and for the last two years, it was quite possible. And since I've joined the BBC, I sit in meetings where they talk about partnerships the whole time. And I think the institution has genuinely changed. I think it is about partnerships. I think it is about collaborations. I think a lot of that down is down to Mark and the work you've done. Um, so uh, why don't you tell us about why this particular partnership is important to the BBC and why the arts more broadly is important to the BBC. Mark Thompson. Yeah, I was going to start on why Schoenberg is good for you, but I'll, I'll leave that. Um, yeah, I wanted to start with this point about, about, about why and, 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 and also how deep that idea of partnership goes. At the very bottom of the idea of the BBC, the thing that the BBC is built on, is an idea, I think, of... of um, it's got a number of names, but let's call it public space, of a place which has got very few barriers, which anyone can come into, and in this space... They meet each other, but they can also exchange and experience all sorts of things. Uh, the familiar, uh, the unfamiliar, the, the challenging, the different, the new. And in the, in the cultural world, uh, uh, this is a very precious idea. The key thing, I think, is that the BBC today, more than it's ever done in the past, recognises it's not alone in this space, that there are other organizations and institutions and individuals who passionately believe in the idea of this space and its potential. Um, and that, you know, when you take what this institution stands for and what this institution stands for, and by the way, what the institutions and, and many of the other bodies in this room stand for, we have so much in common in what we believe in, what we're trying to do, of the doors we're all trying, trying to open. And so we've begun this process, uh, 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 it's not new, nothing, nothing's new in that sense, but of more deeply trying to live that out as an organisation in the way we, we interact with and connect with other in institutions. And you can feel it at one level um, uh, in recent years. You've seen a lot of um, uh, rather visible partnerships between uh, the BBC and other you know, great uh, national institutions, often with the word B at the start of their name, uh, Mr. McGregor and the British, British Museum, uh, the British Library, uh, the Royal Academy, Covent Garden, which is many of them. This is rather like, it's very beautiful, really. It's like uh, when there's natural history films where you see blue whales slowly mating. It's, uh, it's uh, very large, has to be done quite delicately. It can take time, but it's, uh, it's a wonder to behold. Um, but actually, that's really only part of what's going on. Uh, it's quite interesting, even in the history of the world and the hundred objects, it was partly absolutely about that core and above all about, about one, uh, uh, one individual and his particular take on, uh, on civilization. But actually, there were so many other uh, museums and galleries up and down the country involved in that. And I would say that uh, for us, this is about England appropriately today, but also it's about the whole UK. It's about... Small, small partners, small organisations, startups, uh, uh, people whose focus is in one part of this country, one city, one place, uh, as well as uh, uh, other very large-scale organisations. Um, what, what, what are we trying to bring, bring to the table? Um, 
Well, I, I, I want to be fairly clear about this. We, we have got the advantages of scale and uh, funding and a heritage of technology innovation as well as cre creativity going back decades. Um, uh, we know quite a lot now about, about the web, about how you think about content on the web, how you, you might make it, how you think about how you present it to the public. Mobile, we're, we're the biggest provider of content to mobile devices in this country. And again, we thought hard and uh, I've got some lessons, I think we've, we've learned some difficult lessons about mobile. Apps, applications, how you think about uh, particularly the user experience as well as the technical challenge of how you build apps catch up and the whole work way in which you play audiovisual content out um, uh, over these digital devices. That's one thing about scale. I mean, iPlayer um, in January, um, limited to this country currently, 161 million programs uh, served in January alone. This is an astonishing um, thing. But it's, but it's also um, uh, uh, at another level about practically how you get this content onto different devices. If somebody here wants to know how you get rich audiovisual experiences onto the Nintendo Wii. Don't knock it, it's a very big platform, digital platform. We know how to do that. We've kind of, we've, we've had to learn all sorts of things in the highways and byways of, of, of digital devices. And we're also wrestling with challenges like IPTV. How, how, when that main TV is connected to the web, how will people encounter it? How will they want to use it? What should the user experience be like? What are the technical challenges? And I would say in the course of the next 18 months and these seminars and, and masterclasses, we want to share our learnings about that um, uh, 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 and the mistakes we make. Um, we know quite a lot about the economics of uh, and the politics, small p politics of digital distribution, uh, the relationship with the ISPs. And we're also thinking hard about, as, as Nick said at the start, about monetization. We, we, we're going to uh, uh, launch a, a pilot of an international version of the iPlayer on the Apple iPad later this year. And we're, very, we're looking very hard around the world at different ways and again seeking to experiment and pilot different ways of, 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 of how you um, in, encourage people to think about content and ways in which you might get them to pay for content. And all of that is, is in a sense up for grabs and up for conversation, debate and sharing. But we also know, um, at the BBC, we have, you know, we have research and development facilities, we have brilliant computer scientists, we have some of the, some of the brilliant, some of the, some of the founding fathers of the internet in this country. We have behavioral scientists. The solutions of the future are not just gonna come out of the military industrial complex. Uh, we know already the digital story about startups and about how often it's one person with a brilliant idea, a small team with a brilliant idea, um, uh, who actually succeeds. And I want to say um, an incredibly important part of this encounter, just as it is with our encounter with individual makers of radio, makers of television, makers of drama, makers of music, is, is things work well when you bring them together. And I hope that the BBC and the BBC Academy can go into this partnership absolutely ready to learn and to listen and, and to support um, you know, uh, for every one thing that we know and discovered, I think there's something else that we don't know and are unlikely to discover on our own. Uh, and I would say that one of the most precious things about this particular civil partnership, if we can achieve it, is, is a partnership of, of people who are listening and learning uh, from each other. And this is... It's important in itself, but it's a relatively modest uh, 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 thing, this partnership at the moment. I also hope, though, that the business of setting up and doing these seminars and masterclasses begin to feel like a stepping to a stone towards something bigger, which is a conversation of which this is a part, but which can end up being a bigger conversation. Uh, uh, to, to really repeat the same message, when uh, funding is tight or getting tighter, you have to be smarter and you have to work harder at leveraging what you've got. And, and what I would hope is, is that this becomes part of a bigger story of the whole world of the arts uh, uh, in, in England and across the UK, and the BBC, and I would say the other public broadcasts, in particular Channel 4, working harder together 
to make sure that, you know, despite the many pressures that we all face, that this idea of public space can be full of more precious, wonderful things. And rather than going backwards, can actually go forwards. Thank you. Now, both um, Mark and Nick have mentioned the money word, which often doesn't get mentioned in these sort of uh, instances, which I think is a shame because it's an important aspect of it because I think the future will rely on digital for you know, providing something to the bottom line. Now, Google, of course, knows all about making money because you're terribly good at it, aren't you, um, Tom? Uh, Tom uh, Oglu uh, is uh, uh, the creative lead at Google. He's been behind things like the Google Art Project, which is extraordinary. And congratulations. And also the YouTube Symphony Orchestra. Now, I don't read, normally sort of read out these bios, but it's a very good last sentence you've got here, Tom, so I will read it out. He is a Sunday coder, a traditional creative, a digital strategist, and continues to draw and make books in his spare time. Well, that's fantastic. Tom, tell us all about that. <laughs> and... Your view from the outside. Tom Uvelo from Google. Thank you very much. Um, I, feel, um, I feel some pressure now. Um, I'd also probably quite like to start by saying I'm about as far away from the money-making end of our little enterprise, um, although I won't deny that we do make some money. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the BBC and the Arts Council um, for inviting me to be here today. I'm really excited to be sitting on this very eminent panel. Um, um, and I'm rather humbled. Um, I'm also very excited to be able to talk to you about digital, which is my passion, um, and, its, and its future role in the culture sector, which is profoundly important to me. Um, although I do tend to talk rather more about information than I do um, audiovisual, so bear with me if that's a problem. Um, before I start, I should mention that I'm not really here to talk about Google. Um, I'm not in policy, I'm not in partnerships, I'm not in sales, um, I'm not even an engineer. Um, I'm creative, and my team, the Creative Lab, do produce an awful lot of online video, but I think that's probably rather coincidental. I'm here, I think, um, because I'm a creative within that digital world who is rather passionate about culture, our institutions, and the possibilities of the internet to inspire and connect people. I um, did my first HTML class in 1994, just four years after Tim Berners-Lee invented the language. As I was doing a degree in fine art at Oxford at the time, it was uh, rather forward thinking of the university. However, I found it incredibly frustrating and um, remember saying loudly that I'd much rather have a photocopier and some sellotape. Um, and it took me about six years before I next picked up a web page. Um, I did find myself in the first dot-com boom um, and then I found myself in the first dot-com crash. And then I went to work at the Royal Academy, um, where I made the magazine, which is a wonderful physical thing. And I was blissfully happy there. And I did build their first fledgling website for the Academy, and I think they probably just let me do it. I think you sort of mentioned this because I could, and because the cost really was about £20. Pounds. Um, so the first thing I would suggest is that digital can work at that scale. I know everyone has a website now, um, and they're probably expensive, but doing little experiments that can grow, sort of like with a child science set, um, is a great way to learn and, and to be able to fail quietly. Um, and the cost of that experimentation is still very, very low. Um, recently, Rachel Coldcutter at the Royal Opera House did a culture hack day um, where cultural institutions bring data, or data sets, um, to volunteer groups of engineers, or geeks, um, and then um, they compete to try and make something out of those data sets. And the motivations behind this are rather strange, but it's a real phenomenon that's going on around the world at the moment. I would really suggest you look out for them. There was an experiment that came out of this that I found fascinating called When Should I Visit? And what it did is it used a mobile application called Foursquare, which I'm sure you all know, uh, that lets you say you are at a location, say the VNA, um, and check in there. It looked for people visiting institutions around London and then used that to show the times and the dates that people were there. So you ended up with effectively a real-time bar chart showing visitor usage data, um, which is fascinating. And it um, turns out that the VNA is really busy on a Saturday. <laughs> um, 
so I got in touch with him, and he said, yeah, no, actually, it's kind of a bit of a joke, you know, it was just hacking about. But it did make me go, well, why isn't that on every institution's front page when they do have that data and they can give you that information? It is quite useful, and actually, Sunday morning at the Tate is quiet um, until about 11.30, so <laughs> get there early. The... Um, those sorts of things are really simple. They're really quiet. They're very quick. You can do them. If they don't work, drop it. Um, a more artistic creation came out of another hack day, the History Hack Day, which I think happened here back in January. Um, it, the winner was a video called The History of the World in, in 100 Seconds. Um, and what it did, it showed the emergence of civilization via Wikipedia. Um, it was an algorithm that they used, they knocked up, to um, find every document in Wikipedia that had uh, a location and a date from 500 BC to the present day. And then it showed that data against an invisible map of the world. So you see moments in history flare and die like fireworks. As empires fall, wars break out, continents are discovered. It really is very beautiful. It's worth going and finding. It just exists as a video. But it's a very beautiful piece of data art. Um, and it's very interesting, especially when you hear that it doesn't look the same if you do it in French. Um, <laughs> And it's live. <laughs> it's, low, it's true. Um, um, it's live. It will update. It's built on data, and it was created in a day. And data is your new front of house. Um, it's where you exchange information with your audiences um, and where you make them part of your institution and part of projects themselves on your website and off your website. Oh, it's really interesting that we, you actually only heard the word web once in all those talks. Um, we're off the websites now. We're, we're in the world. Um, I think increasingly we, we know this, we see this happening, and we're definitely moving past the time where your website is, is basically a static portrait of an institution. Um, at the Museum of Old and New Art in Hobart in Tasmania, they have a rather wonderful, wonderful handheld guy. Well, well, it's another iPod. Um, but it, it allows them to remove all the wall text. It uses GPS and... and Actually, whether it's near field communication. I don't know. It's a bit geeky. But it, it knows where you are in the museum. It knows what you're looking at. It, it means that you can then choose the kind of information that you want or no information as you experience the text. So you can watch a video, or you can read something pithy and short, or you can read some incredibly dry academic text. And you can experience it. And when you get home, you go to the website, you type in your email address, and they send you the itinerary of all of the objects that you just looked at. It's really simple as an idea. Technically, probably a little more complicated. Um, and of course, Google is very supportive of culture and is trying to find ways to be more so. Um, we're building a culture center in Paris. We recently crowdsourced a surprisingly good movie um, called Life in a Day, which I recommend you go and see out in cinemas in June. And one of my proudest projects is our involvement in the um, YouTube Symphony, which allows people, well, musicians, audition from all over the world for one-off performance. And we had one in Carnegie Hall last year, and we're just going off to Sydney for one next week, which I think will be live on YouTube. Another project I was incredibly lucky just to be associated with was the art project, which started, it really is, when we talk about 20% projects, it's a 20% project. These guys had other jobs. In fact, to pick up the phone one more time, they really launched this. That was their main job. And in the meantime, over the course of 18 months, they were working on this because they believed in it. And we're very lucky in our organisation to have people who are passionate um, and will commit time to do these things. But it was a platform, really, that we built. It was the museums, the 17 museums and galleries from nine different countries that really made it happen. Um, I'm sure everyone here has had a chance to look at it. But to create those physical spaces online in a Street View style, with over 1,000 high-res images and 17 of those incredible gigapixel images, which really allow you to get in and touch the art, or to feel an artist's hand, I mean, that's, a, that's an extraordinary move for, for sort of enabling aspect of digital. Um, for Google, making culture available is as significant as any other form of information. And we're lucky to have access to that incredible technology and the money um, and colleagues who love a challenge and, and are ambitious and want to make that happen. The part of that that most excited us from the beginning was the potential for education and teaching. Um, you can create and share your own collections. Um, and it's been incredibly popular. We've had more than 10 million visits um, and 90,000 of those collections. But there's more we want to do. The future for the projects involves improving it, expanding it, adding museums, although I'm afraid there's a little bit of a list, um, working on the educational aspects and, and developing the potential of the sharing for, for personal collections. 
Um, as a proof of concept, we feel it's been a huge success, and we're, we're really fascinated to see how it moves forward. I'm going to stop now, but I feel one should always end with a point rather than uh, rambling on about things I think are interesting. So the first is that it's, it's going to be increasingly important to blur the gap between creative and technical. You need to be nicer to the IT guys. You need to encourage cross-fertilization, multi-skilling, strategic experimentation, sort of small little projects. Um, it's also worth remembering there really are people outside your organization who do want to help, and you've got to allow them in. Um, the second is that, that data is a word that we will fortunately or unfortunately hear an awful lot more of. Likewise, the concepts of clean data or well-formed data. Your data is powerful and valuable, and that means everything from building plans to visitor numbers to archival records to performance times to pyres photographs to video. All of it is a valuable potential creative resource, and, and making some of it open and available can yield fascinating results. At the very least, it's worth knowing what you have. And finally, I think it's worth considering that most of what we describe as the arts, what we love, started with people experimenting with new media and form, from Renaissance to rap music. Digital is more than just another broadcast platform or a technical skill. It has a philosophy of its own, and it will continue to surround and augment everything that we do. So initiatives like this one by the BBC Academy and the Arts Council, which can help cultural bodies connect further, learn those skills, understand these kind of debates, just cannot be applauded enough, in my opinion. I do wish it every success and look forward to finding ways in which we can be further involved. Thank you very much.